Welcome to Christ the King Church, Shelby, North Carolina's Healing Center. Hi, I'm Melinda, Pastor Moore's daughter. Welcome to our broadcast. Relax and enjoy our teaching. I want to welcome you to Christ the King Church. I'm Dr. Sam Parsons. Today we're going to be studying about how to be servants. Before we get into the Word, let's take just a moment, let's pray, and we'll dig right in. Father, as always, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the time we have today together. I pray, Lord, that you would help me, <coughs> excuse me, that you would help me, Lord, to be able to deliver the words that you've given to me. And I pray, Lord, that your word would come alive in our hearts, in our spirits, as we study them today. Help us, Lord, to truly take your word, apply it to our lives, and help us to be all that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we're taping this, today is the Wednesday before Easter. Tomorrow is what many churches refer to as Maundy Thursday. Now, a lot of Protestant churches don't really talk about that or really don't celebrate that. And... Many people don't know what that really means. Where did the word Maundy come from, and what does it really mean? Well, the word Maundy comes from a Latin word, which was mandate, where we get our word mandate, which means command. Over time, that word mandate was shortened to Maundy. This command that Jesus gave, it was a new commandment, and we're going to get into that in just a moment. The other thing that is significant about Maundy Thursday is that it was the day that Jesus first celebrated the Lord's Supper, as some call it. Others would call it the Mass, um, the Great Thanksgiving, the Holy Eucharist. All of those different words would be used, but the Lord's Supper is one you hear a lot in Protestant denominations. That's when Jesus instituted it was on what's considered Maundy Thursday. So there's a lot of significance to this particular day. So let's look at what this new commandment was that Jesus gave to his disciples this thing that changed everything and was this new commandment that's found in John chapter 13. And let's begin reading at verse 34. It says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Isn't it amazing that that's the way that people are supposed to know that we're Christians? Not by the rules and regulations that we keep, by the way we dress, by the, how big of a Bible we carry around, but by the love that we have for one another. We have it so wrong sometimes we have all these ways and all these different rules and regulations we think we should have in order to be able to show people that we're Christians. But Jesus himself said, this is the way that people will know that you're a disciple of Jesus Christ is the love that you have for one another. That's the true measure of whether we're truly a disciple of Jesus Christ or not, is that love. Now, Jesus, in everything that he did, was always first an example. And that's what, or one of the things I love so much about Jesus. He never did anything, or never told us to do anything, that he didn't provide the example for it first. And if we go back up in chapter 13, we're going to begin reading in verse 2 we'll see how Jesus 
was the very example of what he just told them to do as far as showing love. And a lot of that begins with being a servant. Chapter 13 of John, beginning with verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now, I don't know if you've ever been a part of a foot washing. We've done that here at our church a few times. It's a very humbling experience, but it's also a very moving experience. It's almost difficult to either wash somebody's feet or have your feet washed without almost breaking down into tears. Back in this time frame, people wore sandals. They walked nearly everywhere they went. And their feet got really dusty and dirty because of the type of footwear they had and the fact that all the roads were just dirt. And so their feet needed washing. But for somebody to humble themselves, and especially the very Son of God, God in the flesh, humbling himself to wash the feet of his disciples. What an example of how to be a servant. And when you take part in something like that yourself, even today, there's such a humbling of yourself, but there's such an outpouring of love when you're doing it or when somebody is washing your feet, it's just amazing. But this is what Jesus was doing to his disciples. When we pick up back in verse 6, Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? <clears throat> Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. You see, Peter didn't understand that Jesus was trying to, not, was trying to set an example. But he was showing how the very God incarnate was humbling himself and showing true love, true humility, and the heart of a servant to his disciples. And Peter was trying to say, look, you're never going to do that to me. Why, you're too important. I would never let you do that. But in verse 8, Jesus said, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And finally, in verse 9, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, You are not all clean. Now, isn't it amazing? Jesus knew that Judas Iscariot was going to betray him. And at this point, he washed Judas's feet. Yet he knew that he was going to betray him. Can you imagine? If you knew someone was going to betray you, 
and turn you over to be killed in such a horrible fashion, could you still show love enough to wash their feet? That's what Jesus did. In verse 12, So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now, isn't it Interesting. He's telling them, I've given you the example. This is how I want you to treat one another. We're all human beings. A church is made up of human beings. We hurt one another, sometimes not even meaning to. But we need to learn to love each other in spite of the hurts that we suffer. And love each other even as Jesus loved his disciples and showed them the example. We've been hurt. But most of us have never ever been betrayed to the point that Jesus was to where he was going to be killed in such a terrible way and yet he still washed the feet of the one who was about to betray him and said, I've showed you the example, and this is the way you need to do is just the same way that I've done to you. Wash one another's feet, even the feet of those who are going to betray you. Boy, what a powerful example that he gave them. And you see, our whole thing is that we need to learn to be servants and learn to have the love that Jesus commanded us to have, to love one another even as he loved us. I want to turn now over to Philippians. We're going to be coming back to Mark in just a moment. But Philippians chapter 2. I want to begin reading at verse 1. Philippians 2, verse 1. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. <coughs> I want to pause right there for just a moment. <clears throat> One of the biggest things I see in a lot of relationships, and even the, the key thing I see wrong with our world today is that most people are very, very selfish. All we're worried about is what's in it for me. I want my needs met. I want things the way I want them, and I don't care about anybody else. Yet Paul here is saying, let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but for also for the interests of others. So you see, we should be concerned about the interests of other people. It shouldn't be all about us. It should be about others as well. So it's very important for us to understand that we need to put others higher than ourselves. 
the verse above it, verse 3 says, let each esteem others better than himself. That means we should be thinking about others before we even think about ourselves. And in the world we live in today, that is so far from the norm, and that is so far from what most people do. What's in it for me? What am I going to get out of it? And how can I get mine, and I don't care about what anybody else gets? That's so contrary to what the Word tells us should be the mindset that we all should have. Let's pick back up at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we should have the same mind that was in Christ. He was God in the flesh, yet he came, he lowered himself to the level of being a man. He made himself of no reputation. There are some translations will say he emptied himself, which means he didn't use the power that he had as being God, he came and he lived on this earth as a human being filled with the Holy Spirit rather than using all the godly powers that he had as God. He was the first one to show us how a human being could function being infilled with the power of the Holy Spirit. He was our example as the first one, first person to ever do that. He gave himself up even to death, and then God the Father exalted him and gave him the, na the name above every name. So we're looking at all this and we're seeing that Jesus is our example. He came, he came as a servant, he humbled himself, and he gave us this as an example of how we should be living our lives as well. Now in dealing with his disciples, there were a couple of instances where Jesus had to deal with them and their pride and their desires and we're going to look at a couple of those instances. Let's go back to Mark. I want to look at Mark chapter 10. And it's easy for us sometimes to say, well, if I'd have been one of the disciples, I wouldn't have done that. Well, it's easy to say that. I'm, I feel sure probably we would have been just as bad off as they were. But let's look at Mark 10. We're going to begin with verse 35. <clears throat> Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us that we may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give but it is for those for whom it is prepared. 
So these guys had a lot of pride. They came and they wanted to sit. When Jesus came into his glory, they wanted to be seated on his left and his right hands. The most utmost highest positions right beside Jesus when he was in glory. That's nothing but pure pride talking right there. Verse 41. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. Well, I'm sure we would have been too. I mean, here we are, all of the disciples, been traveling and working with Jesus, and two of them go up asking for special positions. What about the rest of them? Did they not all deserve or think they deserved a special position when Jesus came into his glory? So they were mad that these guys were trying to sneak in and get the highest positions for themselves. But look at what Jesus told them in verse 42. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So again, Jesus is trying to get through to them that if you really want to show who you are as a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus, it goes back to not trying to elevate yourself. It's not trying to have the highest position, but it's in, try, it's in showing that you are a servant and you're willing to serve all of those around you. One of the biggest issues that we see in the church, and I'm talking about the church as a whole, is that people want to be superstars. They want to be elevated, but they don't want to serve the people. They want, they're almost untouchable. They're unapproachable. And yet, how can a person truly be a shepherd over the sheep if the sheep can't even come close to him, if he doesn't know them. The Word says, my sheep know my voice. Well, that's, talk, that's Jesus talking, but shouldn't it be the same when a under-shepherd, the pastor of a church, is given, is given care of a church, those people under him? There should be a relationship there. So there should be a relationship there and he should not be unapproachable. Many pastors, many people in leadership forget that their greatest calling is to be, number one, a servant. That takes a lot. It means... Sometimes when you have plans and one of the sheep needs something, your plans go by the wayside. You have to be there to serve them first of all. So it's a difficult position, but it's where God's called you to be. One other place in Mark 9, so you're close by, just back up one chapter, Mark 9, this is, to me, kind of a humorous one. And Jesus is about to confront his disciples. Mark 9, 33. Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? In other words, he heard his disciples arguing among themselves while they were traveling to Capernaum. And he wanted to know what was going on. Now, I'm sure he knew, but he wanted to know if they were going to tell him. 
In verse 34, it says, But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed or argued among themselves who would be the greatest. Here again, pride. Well, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a disciple, and I'm the greatest disciple. And everybody's going to look to me and think, he's the greatest disciple that Jesus has ever had. That's not the point. We're to do what we're called to do. And in verse 35, it says, He sat down, he called the twelve, and said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Again, he's trying to get their attitude straightened out. One final thing I want to mention in the next verse or two here is this. Back in their time, children were like meant nothing. Children were more than anything else really a nuisance. But look at how Jesus talked to them. In verse 36, said he, Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. What he's saying is, we need to be a servant of all. We need to receive all who come to us and need help. We need to show the love for one another that he commanded us to have. Every Maundy Thursday, we should remember that commandment to love one another as Jesus loved us. And that love was shown by the servant heart that Jesus had. And he wants us to have a servant heart just like he did. Not the desire to be served, but to be a real true servant. Well, I pray that this has been a blessing to you, and may God richly bless, to, bless you until next time. Amen. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome to follow us on Facebook, YouTube, our website. Our Lord is building his kingdom. Join us in helping our Lord harvesting souls for his kingdom. Thank you for watching Christ the King Church Shelby, North Carolina's Healing Center. Visit our website, www.christthekingshelby.org and check us out on Facebook and YouTube.